Welcome to I Was Only Doing My Job, Australia's military history told through the stories of those who've served. I'm your host, Ross Manuel, and let's get started. G'day friends, and welcome to the first episode of Season 3. I wish you all a safe and prosperous new year ahead. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started for the year. Make sure you check out the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Mastodon, and YouTube at IWODMJ where you'll find all my travels around Australia, locating the myriad of memorials that dot the countryside. And if you want to be more involved, join our growing community in Discord. In the episode description, you'll find all the links to these, as well as links to show notes, photos, and supplementary information that didn't quite make it into the episode, as well as a way you can support the podcast directly. Now that is out of the way, let's get started. Charles Edward Kingsford Smith was born on the 9th of February, 1897, at Riverview Terrace in Hamilton, Brisbane, capital of the colony of Queensland. He was the fifth son and seventh child to bank manager William Charles Smith and his wife, Catherine Mary Nee Kingsford. His maternal grandfather was Richard Ash Kingsford, member of the Queensland Legislative Assembly and mayor of both Brisbane and Cairns. At the time of his birth, his family went by Smith. In 1903, the Smiths travelled to Vancouver, Canada, where William went into the real estate business before going to work as a clerk for the Canadian Railways. While in Canada, the family also added Kingsford to the family surname. Kingsford Smith was initially educated in Vancouver before the family returned to Australia in 1907 and settled in Mossman, Sydney. On the 2nd of January 1907, nine-year-old Smith went for a swim with his cousin at the famous Bondi Beach in what would be his first brush with death. Dragged out to sea by a rip, he struggled to stay afloat. He was unconscious when rescued by the newly formed life-saving service and resuscitated by a nurse who happened to be on the beach. It was the Bondi Surf Bathers Life Saving Club's first notable rescue. From 1909 to 1911, he was educated at the St. Andrews Cathedral School, where he was a chorister in the school's choir. He also attended the Sydney Technical High School, before going on to be an electrical engineering apprentice with the Colonial Sugar Refining Company at the age of 16 in 1913. That same year, he would commence serving within the senior cadets. At the commencement of the First World War, the day after his 18th birthday, Charles Kingsford Smith, who by this point in time was gained the very classic Australian nickname of Smithy, joined the Australian Imperial Force on the 10th of February 1915, with three years senior cadets under his belt. For someone as renowned as Charles Kingsford Smith, his service record is definitely one of the most interesting ones I've encountered, especially as his service record from his initial period is missing a lot of the critical information. For starters, here's the first record that I've found that simply states infantry as his initial posting, though there is a crossed off mention to the 19th artillery battery. He testified on his enlistment paperwork that he could ride a horse and a motorcycle, and along with his technical ability, he was reassigned on the 21st of March to the 4th Signals Troop attached to the 4th Light Health Brigade as a sapper. In the First World War, there were two kinds of engineers in the Australian Imperial Force. Field engineers, who constructed bridges and roads, and destroyed fortifications, and signal engineers, who handled wire and radio communications. Smith was the latter. After a brief period of training in Australia, Smith, along with the rest of the first reinforcements to the 4th Signal Troop, departed Sydney aboard the HMAT A31 Ajana on the 31st of May 1915. After additional training in Egypt, where he served as a motorcycle messenger and driver, He suffered a brief injury following an incident where he fell from his motorcycle. He then boarded the HT Melville bound for Gallipoli on the 22nd of September, where he served as a dispatch runner as the terrain was not suited for motorcycles. Riding home to his parents, he told of his landings on the peninsula while being bombed by the Turks. He also described the brush with death on the beach. Quote, I heard ping ping horribly close, he wrote home. I hurriedly sought shelter in a sap, but not before a bullet frayed the edge of my cap quite close enough for me, unquote. He would serve the duration of the campaign before being withdrawn from Gallipoli aboard the SS Simla and return to Alexandria on the 4th of January, following a brief rest in Lemnos. On the 9th of March 1916, Smith would be transferred from the 4th Signal Troop to the newly raised 4th Division Signal Company at Tel El Kabir at the Moscow training camp to join the newly raised 4th Australian Division, and he was promoted to Corporal. The 4th Division trained near the Suez Canal at Serapium, to assist in the defence against possible Ottoman attack, and by the end of May, the division, along with the comparatively inexperienced 2nd Anzac Corps, received its marching orders. It was destined for the Western Front. 
At the start of June, the division moved to France, taking over part of the nursery sector near Amantiers, where they would be introduced to trench warfare in a relatively quiet area. While in France, Smith would be a dispatch rider for the division. Now, despite the plethora of somewhat reliable communication methods used by the belligerent forces during the Great War, wireless was still in its infancy and field telephones were notoriously unreliable, which meant that the most reliable and secure means of transporting messages of critical importance was still a runner. And as the distances on the Western Front were much greater than that on Gallipoli, the 4th Division signals made extensive use of motorcycles. Initially, the process of acquiring motorcycles was identical to the manner in which the Australian Light Horse acquired their mounts where their owner would volunteer along with their mount and were paid an allowance for its upkeep. And while the British Army, and by extension the Australian Imperial Force, had minimum performance requirements for the machines that had been volunteered, it wouldn't be until the latter half of the war where due to maintenance and spare part problems resulted in the military issuing their own machines. Now, while I wasn't able to find the 4th Division SIG's vehicle logs, the plethora of photos of Australian dispatch riders sitting perched atop Triumph Type 8 machines with a sidecar shows a particular preference. For his work in this role, Smith would be promoted to temporary sergeant on the 16th of June, and nine days later would be transferred to divisional headquarters, where this rank was made substantive. The high adrenaline and excitement of riding a motorcycle through war zone must not have been enough for Smith, as on the 29th of October 1916, Sergeant Charles Edward Kingsford Smith transferred to the fledgling Australian Flying Corps, and after a period of training in England, Smith would, on the 16th of March 1917, be discharged from the Australian Imperial Force as a consequence of receiving a commission in the Royal Flying Corps in the British Expeditionary Force as a second lieutenant after passing his officer examination at Exeter College. After only 45 hours of flight training, Smith was promoted to flying officer and posted to No. 23 Squadron Royal Flying Corps in July 1917 when the squadron was involved in close escort duties and offensive air patrols over the Somme River Valley in preparation for the Third Battle of Ypres. For the record, 45 hours of flight training is relatively short by modern standards, but it was the norm at the time, with most pilots completing at least 40 hours before being sent to the front line due to battle and training casualties. In the Second World War, flight training varied between 75 and 100 hours as demand rose and fell, and Smith's modern contemporaries flying supersonic jets undergo at least 195 hours of simulation and training flights before they even get to see their planes. While in England and later on in France, Smith discovered his other passion, that of the company of the so-called fairer sex. And he would routinely write home to his family about the bonds of women that he had liaisons with, fully playing into the stereotype of the playboy fighter pilot. There, he quickly gained the reputation of being a womanizer within the squadron. Within six weeks of being in the air, he had shot down four German aircraft, destroyed a number of observation balloons, along with targets on the ground in his Italian-made Spad S7 biplane fighter before he was shot down on the 14th of August 1917, following an engagement with two German aircraft. While he was able to land safely despite having over 150 bullet holes in the plane's fuselage and having sustained an injury to his left foot, which resulted in at least three toes being amputated, in doing so, he would end his military aviation career. Despite this, he wrote to his parents rather prophetically, quote, I have discovered one thing about flying and that it is my future, and for whatever it may be worth is bound up with it, unquote. After a period of recovery in the military hospital in Regent Park, London, in November 1917, Smith would present himself to Buckingham Palace to be awarded the military cross for his actions. His citation read, quote, For conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty, he has himself brought down four machines during his first month at the front and has done the most valuable work in attacking ground targets and hostile balloons. Of the latter, he forced at least nine to be hauled down by his persistent attacks, during which he was repeatedly attacked himself by large hostile formations, and his efforts undoubtedly stopped all hostile balloon observation during a critical period. His efforts and fine offensive spirit are in disregard of danger have set a very fine example, unquote. At Buckingham Palace, he met King George V, who apparently left formality going by the side when he saw the image of a soldier limping towards him on crutches. The two men spoke for five minutes after the ceremony. And as royal protocol dictates that no one should turn their back on the monarch, as Smith was turning away, he became tangled in his crutches and fell. As officials rushed to assist, the king offered his arm to the young pilot as his crutches were being retrieved. Smith was then allowed to turn his back from the king and exit via a nearby door, making him one of only a few who were ever allowed to turn their back on the king. 
Despite being grounded, Smith would remain within the Royal Flying Corps, serving as an instructor until December 1918, when he was given special leave to return to Australia. Despite the armistice being declared on the 11th of November, Smith would return to England and on the 20th of December, Smith was summoned to Caxton Hall to appear before the medical board and was deemed medically unfit on the 5th of May and was placed on the unemployed list on the 26th of June 1919. I have to say, British service records are completely different from their Australian counterparts. In May of that year, Prime Minister Billy Hughes and Defence Minister George Pearce announced a £10,000 prize for the first crew flight from Great Britain to Australia with the intention of this pioneer journey being strictly an Australian affair. They also set the requirements that the aircraft being used had to be British built, had to leave either from Hunslow Heath Aerodrome or the Royal Naval Air Station Castlot, and they had to be in Australia by the end of 1920. In total, six crews of Australian airmen took part, but only two actually made the journey. And only one, the crew of Captain Ross McPherson Smith and his brother, Lieutenant Keith McPherson Smith, reached there by the time of the deadline, arriving in Darwin on the 10th of December. Smith, who had no relation to the famous Smith brothers, had acquired a crew of Lieutenants Cyril Maddox and Valderman Rendell aboard a Blackburn RT-1 Kangaroo, which was a twin-engine torpedo biplane with the intention of participating. However, due to issues pertaining to international clearances, the aircraft's engines, and Smith's inexperience as being a navigator, it wasn't until the Smith brothers had actually arrived in Darwin when the kangaroo was cleared to depart, England. But it did so without either Maddox or Smith, as Captain Hubert Wilkins MC took their place. Though the aircraft didn't get very far, as it crashed in Crete within two weeks of taking off. Something that was interesting about this point in Smith's life is that he was reluctant to wear his Royal Flying Corps uniform. As he had watched so many of his brothers die in it, Modern historians have pointed out that from his writings and experiences, it was more than likely that Smith was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and anxiety brought on by his numerous near-death experiences, though no one at the time would have dared to suggest such things to him. Despite these reservations, he still had the urge to fly. Smith and Maddox piloted joy flights in England as Kingston Smith Maddox Aeros Limited. Interestingly, Maddox's name was not spelt the same way in the company title. Spurned for not being able to participate in the air race, Smith instead travelled by the Star of Lapland to the United States of America in an attempt to attract sponsors for a trans-Pacific flight, a journey that would become an obsession for him, though at this point he would fail to generate enough interest for the venture. So, like so many other post-war flyers, he turned to barnstorming as a part of aerial circuses to make a living, along with a period of time where he served as a stunt pilot for Hollywood silent films. While these cavalier enterprises were inherently dangerous, it did allow combat flyers the chance to compete against one another and aircraft manufacturers to push the limits of new technology. He wouldn't remain a barnstormer for long though, as after the death of a fellow pilot at an event, Smith decided it was time to head home, and he returned to Australia in January 1921. Initially, he arrived in Sydney, where he flew joy flights for the Diggers Aviation Company, before finally settling in Western Australia. It probably didn't help the fact that he was also broke when he walked into the Geraldton offices of the newly established West Australian Airways. West Australian Airways, or Airways as it was known, had the distinction of being the first airline in Australia with a scheduled air service. Becoming a salaried pilot for the company, he would eventually rise to the rank of the airline's chief pilot due to his prowess as a long-distance pilot. Despite his rise in the company, it was often reported that he would regularly take women up on flights for the express purposes of sleeping with them, continuing his womanizing persona. Despite their reputation, while based at Port Hedland on the 6th of June 1923 at Marble Bar in the Pilbara region of Western Australia, he married Thelma Eileen Cope Corbury and the couple would settle in Carnarvon. The Airways pioneered airmail operations in the far northwest transporting mail, passengers and later cargo across the country. However, events on the other side of the Pacific would switch Smith's life into another gear. In 1924, Smith would leave the airways along with fellow pilot and veteran Keith Vincent Anderson to run the Gascoigne Transport Company out of Carnarvon with the end desire to purchase two Bristol Tourier biplanes. Gascoigne Transport Company was sold to the Australian conglomerate West Farmers to become the largest transport operator in Western Australia before it was sold to the logistics courier service Toll Holdings in 2001. In January 1927, both Smith and Anderson took those Bristol Touriers from Perth to Sydney in the hope of breaking the established flight record of 21 and a half hours set in 1920. However, neither pilot got anywhere near the record, reaching Sydney after 30 hours due to a headwind. 
In May 1927, the American aviator Charles Lindbergh made his famous New York to Paris Atlantic crossing aboard the Spirit of St. Louis and immediately entered the history books. With the world becoming smaller every day, Smith and Anderson packed up and traveled to Sydney with fellow Great War veteran Charles Ulm to operate interstate flying services. But Smith's dream of a trans-Pacific flight between the United States and Australia resurfaced. And with it, the realization that it would require financial backing and the only way to make enough money to make it viable would meant flying mail for the government. Though the company failed initially to secure a tender for a Adelaide to Perth mail service, that didn't stop them from trying. To successfully gain government contracts to fly mail in those days, you'd had to have a reputation as an experienced flyer. To gain such a reputation, many flyers did promotional flights to show off their abilities to conduct long-distance uh, flights. So, Smith acquired sponsorship from the Herald and Weekly Times of Melbourne, The Sun in Sydney, and The Daily Mail of Brisbane to conduct a flight around Australia in 10 days, 5 hours in 1927. This feat gained a £9,000 grant from the New South Wales government. With the backing of Sidney Meyer and the Californian oil magnate George Allen Hancock, Smith, Anderson and Ulm were off to the United States to procure an appropriate aircraft to complete the approximate 11,600 km journey from the west coast of the United States to the east coast of Australia. After some searching, Smith and Ulm settled on a Fokker F7 trimotor monoplane that had been owned by Australian polar explorer Sir Hubert Wilkins, the same man who took the kangaroo off their hands in England and crashed it in Crete. After acquiring the Fokker, they renamed it Southern Cross and to get public support, they made two attempts on the United States transcontinental record but failed to gain any substantive nationwide attention or professional admiration. Apparently at this time, there was a falling out between Anderson and the other two as he returned to Australia before Southern Cross had been acquired. So he was replaced by the American crew members, Harry Lyons as navigator and James Warner as radio man. There was also growing opposition in New South Wales about the endeavour with even the Returned Soldiers Association, the precursor to the Return and Services League, petitioning the New South Wales Premier to withdraw the support of the previous state government had provided to, quote, save the airmen from themselves, unquote. As in the preceding seven months, 25 other airmen had been killed in trans-oceanic flights, and while the association acknowledged the men's bravery, the whole affair was considered purely a stunt. The danger was not lost on Smith and his crew as the four meticulously rehearsed their emergency procedures prior to the flight, planning to dump their fuel and use the wings as rafts if they had to ditch in the sea, as well as carrying enough food and water for a week if they had to go down. Even with their growing opposition, Smith and his team departed Oakland, California at 8.54am on the 31st of May 1928 aboard the Southern Cross. Their first leg was from Oakland to Wheeler Army Airfield in Honolulu, Hawaii, a distance of 3,870 kilometers or 2,400 miles, and was an uneventful 27 hours and 25 minutes, save that the Southern Cross soon lost its direction finding radio beacon, requiring the experienced navigator lines to select the required course by dead reckoning and managed to steer the plane to Hawaii without further incident. The second leg was the longest and most dangerous when they departed Barking Sands on Manakawai, as Wheeler's runway wasn't long enough for the Southern Cross to reach a takeoff speed with her added fuel reserves. After travelling 5,077 kilometres or 3,155 miles, and they were able to land on a cricket field in Suva, Fiji after 34 hours 30 minutes, which was the world's longest flight over water at that time and would have been eventful for Smith as it was well documented that the man was terrified of flying over water. This was brought on by his near drowning as a child and would have been compounded by the massive lightning storm the Southern Cross had to navigate at the equator, which resulted in water entering the plane's unpressurized cabin. To make matters worse, one of the engines began to run rough. After landing in Suva, the American crew departed, leaving Ulm and Smith to complete the remaining 2,709 kilometer or 1,638 mile journey to Australia on their own. After flying for 20 hours, they crossed the Australian coastline at Ballina before turning to fly north to fly the remaining 170 kilometers to Brisbane, where they landed at 10.50 a.m. on the 9th of June to a crowd of 26,000 people for a flight of approximately 11,566 miles and roughly 83 hours. That same flight takes 21 hours and 15 minutes and flies exactly the same route, including a stopover in Honolulu in a pressurized jet with comfort and refreshing beverage. This stark difference is even more impressive in that Smith and his crew didn't have any of the modern safety and navigational safeguards we have now. No GPS, no long-range radios, or even accurate maps. Flying essentially in an open cabin aircraft through storms with no means of signaling distress or ability to request assistance if anything were to happen. 
After a brief stop in Brisbane, the Southern Cross flew to Sydney, landing to a massive crowd of 300,000 people who wanted to see the now famous plane and crew. The other thing waiting for Smith and his crew landing in Sydney was a pair of legal papers. First, Anderson sued Smith and Ulm for a portion of the proceeds of the flight, even as going so far as having a court order that grounded the Southern Cross. I'm just stepping away briefly from the life, service and legacy of Charles Kingsford Smith to give a special mention to the guys over at 25 for Coffee. They are a veteran-owned business based in New South Wales. Now, this isn't an ad read, but between the seasons, I got a DM from them telling me that they love the podcast and wanted to send me some of their cold-pressed, whiskey-infused coffee to show their support. And let me tell you that when I cracked open that can, I was immediately reminded of gunfire breakfast just after the dawn service on Anzac Day. I've included a link to their store in the show notes as my way of saying thanks for supporting the podcast. But now, back to the show. Anderson had contributed to this organization and financial backing and was angered that he missed out on the historical event. The other legal proceeding was from Smith, who issued his wife Thelma with divorce papers on the grounds that she had deserted him for another man. His divorce was uncontested as the couple had already been estranged since 1925. And the only reason why I'm bringing it up now is how it was reported in the very same way that gossip mags talk about the latest celebrity breakup today. I'll include a press clipping in the show notes. Anderson's lawsuit was withdrawn with him accepting the argument that by leaving America of his own free will, he had forfeited membership in the partnership and any fame that would have come from it. With both these legal clouds lifted, Smith and Ulm were free to take the Southern Cross to greater and greater achievements. On the 19th of June, Smith would receive the Air Force Cross for the Trans-Pacific Flight and on the 21st of June, he appointed as Honorary Squadron Leader in the Royal Australian Air Force Reserve. Almost on the coattails of his Trans-Pacific flight, on the 10th of August 1928, Smith and Ulm took the Southern Cross to Point Cook near Melbourne in preparation for their next flight. On the 13th of August, they departed the Point Cook Aerodrome and in 23 hours, 21 minutes later, Southern Cross landed at the Maylands Aerodrome in Perth to an apparently tame reception for making the first non-stop flight from the East Coast of Australia to the West Coast. For those keeping track, that flight now takes four hours. Not to be outdone, this flight was followed on the 10th of September by Ulm and Smith leaving Richmond Aerodrome in Western Sydney for an overnight flight arriving in Christchurch, New Zealand the following morning after a 14-hour trip through icing conditions, which is now a three-hour flight. This was the first time the Tasman Sea had been successfully traversed by air. Sadly, a New Zealand expedition went missing on the reverse flight earlier in the year. To commemorate this, the crew of the Southern Cross dropped a wreath in the Tasman Sea an estimated 241 kilometres from New Zealand. It should be noted that Smith had planned this flight the week before, but complaints arrived from New Zealand when it was revealed that they would have arrived on Sunday. This caused an issue with the local parishes. As it happened, unfavourable weather developed over the Tasman and the flight was deferred, so it's not known whether or not Smith would have heeded the cable requesting him to change his mind. When they returned to Australia, they were already planning their next big journey and it would start 1929 with the announcement of the creation of the Australian National Airways, though it wouldn't start operations for nearly a year. At the end of March 1929, Smith and Ulm were once again boarded the Southern Cross at the Richmond Aerodrome and set off towards Wyndham in Western Australia for the first leg of a flight to London. However, by the 5th of April, the Southern Cross had been reported missing in the region around Drysdale Mission in the Kimberleys in far northwestern Australia. Almost immediately, a search had been organised, including five aircraft, including two from West Australian Airways. One unlikely searcher was Keith Vincent Anderson, who, despite his falling out with Smith and Ulm, climbed into his monoplane Kookaburra, declaring he to leave no stone unturned in his search. Australian fighter ace Leslie Hubert Holden, MC AFC, aboard his own plane, the Canberra, located the Southern Cross on a mudflat near the Glenig River on the 12th of April, with a party from a nearby Kanamania mission reaching the plane via an overland route. Lester Joseph Bryan from Qantas would sadly locate the wreck of the Kookaburra on the 21st of April, with Keith Vincent Anderson's body found eight days later. This incident sparked conspiracy theories almost immediately, with some speculating that Smith and Anderson had colluded on fabricating this appearance in an attempt to end elevate Anderson's status. However, a Commonwealth inquiry into the matter exonerated Smith of any collusion or staging of the event to gain attention. The flight to England was resumed in June and completed in record time of 12 days, 18 hours. These days, it's a 16-hour flight. Not to be slowed down, in July 1929, Smith and Ulm were bound for Amsterdam, eventually landing the Southern Cross on the 21st of July to large crowds and a civil reception organised by the Dutch Air Force and the Fokker Aircraft Company, the original makers of the Southern Cross. 
While Smith and Ulm enjoyed the hospitality of the Dutch population, Southern Cross underwent an extensive and lengthy overhaul in preparation for a round-the-world flight attempt. Returning to Australia with aircraft for Australian National Airways to begin operations in January 1930, he arrived with five Avro 61810s with Smith piloting the Southern Cloud on the Sydney to Melbourne route. Smith, however, was not content to slowly fly domestic routes, and by May, he was once again in Amsterdam to collect his old bus and set out on an east-west crossing of the Atlantic. After a brief flight from Amsterdam to London, on June 6, he departed from the Baldanel Aerodrome in Ireland, arriving the same day, before flying to Curragh from the Atlantic crossing. On the 25th of June, owing to the weather, Southern Cross departed Ireland bound for New York. However, after 29 hours flying through thick fog, he landed Harbour Grace, Newfoundland. On the 27th of June, Smith arrived in New York to approximately 5,000 adoring New Yorkers and given the ticker tape parade. While there, he was asked of the two, was the Pacific or the Atlantic crossing the more difficult? To which Smith replied that the navigation of the Pacific was worst, but the Atlantic had the worst weather. He then returned to where it all began on the 4th of July with the Southern Cross landing in Oakland. By including Smith's first flight from Oakland to Brisbane, his trans-Australian, Perth to London, London to Ireland, Ireland to Newfoundland, Newfoundland to New York, New York to Oakland flights, Smith and Ulm were the first aviators to complete a cross-equator circumnavigation, and at some point in this history-making journey, he was promoted to both honorary wing commander and later honorary group captain. At the completion of his journey, Smith flew the Southern Cross one final time from Oakland to Santa Maria to return her to Captain George Allen Hancock. The original magnate had funded the purchase of the plane back in 1928. On the 8th of July 1930, Southern Cross would become a museum piece at the Hancock Foundation School of Aeronautics. Smith then returned to London by way of New York to collect an Avro avian biplane. There are some inconsistencies on the name, which some sources calling the plane Southern Cross Junior and others calling it Southern Cross Minor. But for consistency, I'll be referring to it as Junior. In October, he attempted to break the initial record Smith was prevented from participating in in 1919 by tackling the England to Australia air race. This time, however, he would do it solo and won the event, arriving on the 22nd of October 1930 after 10 days. In November following his return, Smith would receive an honorary rank of Air Commodore within the Royal Australian Air Force Reserve. He would then round out the 1930s by celebrating his second marriage to Mary Powell on the 10th of December at Scott's Church in Melbourne. Smith met Mary on the voyage from the United States to Australia back in 1929, and the two became engaged soon after the dissolution of his marriage to Thelma Corby. One of the gifts Smith gave her was a diamond brooch in the shape of the Fokker Southern Cross. The wedding was apparently the society event of the year and attracted over 10,000 well-wishers, disrupting traffic in Melbourne's Collins Street for hours. Smith was also the inaugural recipient of the Seagrave Trophy, awarded for, quote, outstanding skill, courage, and initiative on land, water, and in the air, unquote. Not long into 1931, Smith and Ulm would join the ranks of the New Guard, an extreme, far-right, ultra-nationalist, anti-communist, royalist, paramilitary organization that was formed out of the so-called Old Guard, who in turn was created in response to the rise in trade unions, communist groups, and the re-election of New South Wales Labor Premier Jack Lang, the same Premier who gave Smith the initial grant. It was comprised mainly of veterans from the Great War and led by veteran Eric Campbell. Its largest claim to fame was when member Francis de Groot interrupted the opening of Sydney Harbour Bridge by riding across it on horseback in full uniform and cut the ribbon with his sabre. While the organisation contained former high-ranking members of the Australian Imperial Force, one scout they never managed to get was that of General Sir John Monash, who they wished to install as a dictator, due to the fact that his popularity in the veteran community meant that he could rally the entire 300,000-strong veteran community to march on Canberra. Monash famously rebuffed them by saying, Quote, depend upon it, the only hope for Australia is the ballot box and an educated electorate, unquote. The new guard wouldn't last and would be dissolved in 1935, following the 1932 constitutional crisis that saw the sacking of New South Wales Premier Jack Lang. Overall, 1931 was an interesting year for Smith. It started with the arrival of the SS Golden Bear from San Pedro, California. Tucked into within its cargo hold was the original Southern Cross. George Hancock decided that the plane was to be gifted to the people of Sydney. Smith, however, had other plans, and had his old bus delivered to his mascot airline headquarters and reassembled. On the 21st of March, Smith used it in his search for the missing Australian National Airways plane, Southern Cloud, which had gone missing in a flight between Sydney and Melbourne with eight passengers aboard. Southern Cloud would not be found until 1958. 
As a result, Southern Cross would be allocated to the ANA fleet, though the damage to the airline's reputation had long-term effects. Later in April, the Southern Cross was again pressed into service to rescue the England-Australian Mel from an Imperial Airways aircraft that crashed in Copang in Timor. When it returned to Australia, Smith returned to his roots and used the venerable plane in barnstorming by providing thousands of Australians with their first flight. The aircraft also operated two airmail services across the Tasman with further barnstorming in New Zealand. September saw him taking part in a solo flight aboard the Southern Cross Junior to England to attempt to break the England-Australia solo flight record once again, though the stress of his arduous career had started to take its hold and he had had to abandon the attempt, completing the trip in 13 days. Back in Australia, he collaborated with the Marks Motor Construction Company, of which he was a director, to produce the Southern Cross automobile. He designed an open-top tourer of a contemporary design, of which at most 10 were made. However, there are no surviving examples. In November, with one of his company planes were under contract to fly Christmas mail from England was damaged in Malaya, he took off in another plane to collect the stranded mail, flew it to England in time for Christmas delivery, and returned with mail for Australia. This incident, however, was the nail in the coffin for an Australian National Airways and would cease operations in December. This was due to a combination of aircraft not suited for the conditions in Australia, the lack of appropriate navigation aids, the issues of the Great Depression impacting air travel, and the overall poor business ability of the CEO, Charles Kingswood Smith. These are also the same reasons why the Australian and New Zealand governments refused his plan for a trans-Tasman passenger service. Despite this setback, Smith would be bestowed with the title of Knight Bachelor for his services to aviation and the King's birthday on his list of June 1932. A Knight Bachelor was a basic rank granted to a man who had been knighted but not inducted as a member of one of the organised orders of chivalry. Interestingly, it's the Knight Bachelor that allows an inductee to be referred to as Sir. For the rather informal Smith, he recoiled the notion of being referred to as Sir Kingsford Smith and Dublin played it at every opportunity preferring to still be referred to as Smithy, though some outlets refer to him as Sir Smithy and even Kingy from this point on. The knighthood would soon be eclipsed with the Kingsford Smiths welcoming their only child, a son Charles, on the 22nd of December, 1932. Smith would start 1933 with a flight from Jerengong in the south coast of New South Wales on the 11th of January for a joyriding tour of New Zealand. The initial flight took 14 hours before landing in New Plymouth on New Zealand's North Island. While there, he attempted to persuade the New Zealand government to give him a charter for a passenger and mail service between Auckland and Singapore. He returned to Australia on the 27th of March empty-handed, and while the tour did generate income, his financial status was precarious as on the 1st of March, Australian National Airways entered voluntary liquidation. In March, he also announced a plan to take passengers on a return flight from Australia to London over the course of six weeks for £600 return which adjusted for inflation would be $64,189.24 in today's money for a holiday which would cost approximately $5,000 today. Though judging by the papers of the time, this flight did not end up happening as instead for most of 1933, Smith spent most of his time and the Southern Cross flying joy flights around Australia in an attempt to encourage passion services around the country. He also established the Kingsford Smith Testimonial Fund which was set up to assist the Far West Children's Health Scheme, a charity established to help children from regional Australia have access to both health and education services, as well as respite services to help improve the developmental standards of children in the bush. On the 26th of June, the first Southern Cross automobile was unveiled by Lady Kingsford Smith at the Mascot Aerodrome, as Smith was taking the car's namesake on a month-long tour of the Northern Rivers. The car would be unique in that it was a chassisless car design and constructed very similar to that of an aircraft, using lightweight materials instead of the usual heavy steel seen in cars at the time. Now, I'm not a car person, but apparently this announcement was apparently a very big deal. Returning for his tour, Smith would work alongside the Royal Australian Navy in search for the collier Christina Fraser, which had gone missing near Gabo Island on the 24th of June. Despite his assistance, the Christina Fraser and her 17-man crew were never located. In July, he announced his plans to complete another England to Australia solo flight, and towards the end of 1933, prospects brightened. After travelling to England by sea in September, he broke the solo record flying from London to Wyndham, West Australia, in a Percival Gull, named Miss Southern Cross. In just over seven days, it was proclaimed the world's greatest airman as a result. After this feat, the Commonwealth Government granted him £3,000 and he was appointed an aviation consultant to the Vacuum Oil Company, which would later merge with Mobile Oils. By this point, he held more long-distance flying records than anyone else on Earth. In early August, it was announced that his major achievements would be put to film in a talkie 
and on 18th of August, Kingsford Smith Air Services was registered in New South Wales as an aerial conveyance service. This was immediately followed up on the 21st of August when he left once again to fly to Holland via the Royal Dutch Airways before eventually arriving in London on the 18th of September to purchase another Percival Gull aircraft. Owing to weather issues, it wouldn't be until the end of the month where he would return to Australia on a flight that he made abundantly clear was not to be chasing the break or breaking his previously established record. After returning to Australia at a function in November, he announced that following an upcoming air race, he would cease all further long-distance flights due to an assurance that he had given to his wife. Apparently, he made this assurance numerous times. However, at 38, he considered himself too old for the stresses. Though he claimed that trans-Tasman flights didn't count, which he highlighted by the end of the year with the first commercial flight between Australia and New Zealand. However, the adulation couldn't last forever, as he would be publicly criticised for deciding to go with an American Lockheed Altair monoplane instead of going with the British de Havilland Comet or the Australian-built Kodok. In June, Smith was in San Pedro, California, once more to oversee its completion before departing with the craft which he called Anzac aboard the SS Mariposa, with members of the International Union of Longshoremen loading the plane despite a waterfront strike at the time. Considering he was still a member of the New Guard, which was anti-unions, this probably didn't fill him with a lot of confidence. On the return trip, it would seem that the bureaucratic red tape attempted to derail his plans, as the Department of Customs refused Smith from offloading the plane unless he sourced a certificate of airworthiness, despite doing so in New York. However, the United States was not a signatory to the International Convention of Air Navigation, so it wasn't accepted. While in New York, Smith also had a luncheon with Amelia Earhart and her husband. On the 25th of July, the Customs Department gave Smith a certificate of airworthiness and the plane was unloaded from the tennis court of the Mariposa where it had been secured. He then flew the plane to his mascot headquarters. The decision to call the plane Anzac came from the fact that while it was an American plane, it was being flown by Australians. However, the name caught the eye of the Return Services League as the protection of the term Anzac prevents its use in commercial settings. So on the 26th of July, the plane was renamed Lady Southern Cross in honour of his wife. He would spend August putting Lady Southern Cross through her paces in preparation for the McPherson London Melbourne Air Race, to mark the centenary of the foundation of Melbourne. Though due to issues with the credentials for the plane, he was restricted to flying a total of three miles from the mascot aerodrome. Despite this, Smith and his co-pilot, Sir Patrick Gordon Taylor, routinely broke speed records flying between Australia's capital cities. In late September, as the two men prepared to fly Lady Southern Cross to England, there was an accident and a portion of the Lady Southern Cross's engine cowling cracked to the point where there was no possibility of it being repaired in time to reach London for the planes weighing in at the Middle Hall Aerodrome on October 14. As I researched this section during using newspaper archive trove by the Australian National Library, the reporting of the cascading damage painted a rather grim photo of what Smith was up against to the point where it was reported that he would have to break the Sydney-London flight record just to make it on time. On the 4th of October, Smith announced that he was withdrawing from the race. This news rocked the aviation community to the point where his colleague and former navigator, Charles Ulm, who had moved to the United States, actually offered to buy him a new plane to compete in the race, even going so far as to offer his own plane. And the Royal Aero Club, who was overseeing the race, offered to exempt him from the rules that required him from being in London by the 14th. At a press conference, Smith stated that even with these allowances, he would not have reached London by the time that the first planes were expected to land in Melbourne. Sadly, as is the case now, this public figure withdrawing from an event immediately saw the court of public opinion turn on him. The media criticised him and he received white feathers in the mail, which for someone who served in the Great War, albeit briefly, would have been an affront to him. In a tradition that apparently dates back to the Crusades, during the war, groups of women would approach men of warfighting age with no visible deformity, who were out of uniform and hand them a white feather, inferring that they were a coward. The intent was to pressure men to enlist, but had the unintended effect of targeting men needed for the war effort, men who were disqualified from serving due to enlistment standards, veterans on leave, and soldiers who had been discharged due to injury. So this act would have been an attack on Charles Kingsford Smith's character for an incident beyond his control. Amidst the vitriol he received, he announced that due to the issues he faced with getting a domestic license for the plane, along with the withdrawal of its airworthiness certificate, that he would conduct the first west-east crossing of the Pacific, wherein he would sell Lady Southern Cross in the United States to pay back his backers. On the 21st of October, Charles Kingsford Smith departed Archerfield Airport in Brisbane, Queensland, in the hope of completing what he had achieved in 1928, but in reverse and only with half the crew. 
After 1,881 miles and 13 hours through continual headwinds and poor visibility, often forcing Lady Southern Cross to fly at wave top level, one thing that Lady Southern Cross had over its predecessor and the original Southern Cross was the addition of a wireless radio set, which allowed the crew to report their location back to Australia, something that Smith would have dreamed of on his original flight. After landing in Suva, Fiji, poor weather grounded the plane until the 24th, when an aborted takeoff actually resulted in Lady Southern Cross ending up in shallow water, though details are vague as to how the plane ended up there. The plane was able to extricate itself under its own power, but as a precaution, another takeoff wouldn't be attempted for another five days. Back at home, he was facing claims in the media that he didn't intentionally mislead backers about the air race to the point where race organiser Sir McPherson Robertson took numerous speaking engagements to defend him and his conduct. Fortunately for Smith's sake, he was not in a position to defend himself as he was departing Fiji bound for Wheeler Field in Honolulu, arriving at 8.40am on the 29th of October after travelling 2,750 miles in exactly 25 hours, during which the plane plummeted 6,000 feet due to a severe storm. Smith was escorted by a trio of US Army Air Corps planes and greeted by a crowd of 5,000 people who swarmed the plane and decorated both Smith and Taylor with floral reeds. An oil leak from Lady Southern Cross's engine delayed their departure as a storm cloud started to gather once again, threatening to ground the aircraft. Fortunately, the damage was repaired and the break in the clouds allowed Smith and Taylor to depart Wheeler Field at 2.15pm on November 3rd, arriving in Oakland at 7.44am November 4th, the total flight time taking 51 hours. Despite the delays and horrendous weather, this flight smashed 30 hours off the record he created in the east-west crossing and broke the then travel flight record between Honolulu and the American mainland, taking only 15 hours. The two Americans who joined him on his 1928 flight, Henry Lyons and James Warner, greeted him on arrival. After a period of rest in Smith's brother's property, they flew on to Los Angeles that afternoon. This achievement quickly silenced Smith's critics, with even the participants of the McPherson Air Race proclaiming that his achievement was far more important and more difficult than the race itself. This was highlighted by the fact that no one had attempted to break Smith's record since he made the original crossing in 1928, and he was the only person at the time to have crossed the Pacific twice in both directions. Unfortunately, it would seem that his detractors would once again catch up with him, as Lady Southern Cross was seized by Los Angeles Marshals due to a lawsuit laid by an American who had backed him on his 1928 crossing. He immediately challenged the claims, and the suit would eventually be settled out of court. While in America, Smith and Taylor were guests of honor at public receptions, visited Hollywood to talk about turning their experiences into a movie, and Smith was made an honorary Los Angeles police captain. In London, a chrysanthemum was named after him, and on top of that, he received a flood of contracts for flying stunts, lecture tours, and appearances in movies. All this was happening, Smith was also in talks with the United States Army by breaking his east-west Pacific flight in a twin-engined Lockheed Electra, same kind of plane now made famous by Amelia Earhart, though this idea doesn't pan out. On Armistice Day, 11th of November, 1934, Smith was declared Honorary Parade Marshal in Brisbane. On the 12th of November, Smith announced that Lady Southern Cross would be put up for sale, as well, quote, there may be glory, but there is little cash in aviation feats, unquote, and the record-breaking plane was going to be sold off to pay his sponsors, reimburse his accounts, and allow him to book passage back to Australia. For the remainder of 1934, Smith would attempt to earn a living in the United States as a pilot, but saw very little success. Taylor, at this point, had moved on to London. In a devastating turn of events, Smith's initial co-pilot, Charles Elm's plane, went missing on a Tokyo-Los Angeles flight attempt in December that year. On the 8th of January 1935, Smith departed San Francisco aboard the SS Monterey bound for Australia and reached Sydney on the 28th of January. On his arrival, he received his long-awaited authorization for a trans-Tasman air mail service. The inaugural flight was conducted aboard the old bus, the Southern Cross, on the 15th of May, 1935, and was, for all instances, a failure in a setting of spectacular courage. Before dawn at 800 kilometers out over the Tasman, the nose-mounted propeller broke free and disabled one of the wing-mounted engines, and the second motor threatened to seize up due to rapidly burning oil. Captain Taylor, who had joined Smith for this venture, climbed out of the cockpit and, with great disregard to his own safety, was able to collect enough oil from the sump by the cupful from the disabled wing-mounted engine to replenish the other. While they had to jettison all cargo and most of the mail, Smith was able to nurse the mortally wounded Southern Cross back to Sydney, though her flying days were at an end. Smith would spend the rest of the year as an instructor and public speaker until, at the age of 38, he decided to embark on what would become his last adventure. 
He organised for the still unsold Lady Southern Cross to be moved from its Oakland warehouse where it had been undergoing overhaul to be shipped to England and an airworthiness certificate issued. Smith was going to attempt the London-Melbourne record flight one last time. From there, he, along with the navigator, John Thomas Petherbridge, took off on the 6th of November 1935, and for the most part the flight was uneventful. Until two days into his journey, Lady Southern Cross was reported three hours overdue from its scheduled arrival in Singapore, then four, then five. It had been last seen over Akiab on the east coast of the Bay of Bengal in Burma. Due to an intense storm, concerns started to be raised about the welfare of the plane and crew, and an extensive search was orchestrated, sadly with no sign. It was presumed by authorities that the Honorary Air Commodore, Sir Charles Kingsford Smith, MC, AFC, and John Thomas Petherbridge were lost when Lady Southern Cross crashed into the sea somewhere off the coast of Burma. Smith was 38 at the time he was declared dead, leaving behind a wife and son Charles. On the 1st of May 1937, about 18 months after the disappearance, two Burmese fishermen found a landing gear assembly floating in the Andanam Sea in Kornier Kun, off the west coast of Burma. Lockheed was able to confirm that it was from the Lady Southern Cross. And because fate is fickle like that, with all his connections with aviatrix Amelia Earhart, she too went missing on the 5th of January 1939 as she was attempting her own circumnavigation attempt. Charles Kingsford Smith was commemorated on the Australian $20 bill from 1966 to 1994 and is also depicted on the Australian $1 coin in 1997, the centenary of his birth. In 1986, he was inducted into the International Air and Space Hall of Fame at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. Sydney's International Airport, located not far from his mascot headquarters, is named the Kingsford Smith International Airport, which resides within the Federal Electoral Division of Kingsford Smith and is a suburb called Kingsford. There's a memorial to him, Taylor and Ulm, at Anderson Park in Sydney. His most famous aircraft, the Southern Cross, is now preserved and displayed in a purpose-built memorial to Kingsford Smith near the International Terminal at Brisbane Airport. Kingsford Smith Drive in Brisbane passes through the suburb of his birth, Hamilton, and another Kingsford Smith Drive is located in the Canberra district of Belconnen. Opened in 2009, Kingsford Smith School in the Canberra suburb of Holt is also named after him as was the Sir Charles Kingsford Smith Elementary School in Vancouver, British Columbia. Albert Park in Suva, where he landed on the Trans-Pacific flight, contains the Kingsford Smith Pavilion and a memorial stands at Seven Mile Beach in New South Wales commemorating the first commercial flight to New Zealand. Qantas named their 6th Airbus A380 after him and KLM did the same to one of their 747s. And to Ryan and Olaf, a trans NK propeller moonlet, which is an infrared minor body located within Saturn's rings, is also named after him. Charles Kingston Smith's contribution to civil aviation was without question, and it's easy to say he was one of the world's most influential aviation pioneers. But the question remains, how does he factor into military history? While Smithy held an honorary commission in the Royal Australian Air Force Reserve, his exploits pushed the boundaries of aviation, plotting air corridors around the world and testing the very limits of an aviation industry that was still very much in its infancy. He paved the way for the likes of Peter Turnbull and Bluey Truscott and allowed air crews to fly long distances over large bodies of water and pioneer the concept of over-the-horizon warfare. And for bringing the world much closer together, I can say we are all thankful. And there you have it, that is the life, service and legacy of Honorary Air Commodore Sir Charles Edward Kingsford Smith, Air Force Cross, Military Cross. This episode was requested by A Section member Ayoshi Star, a member of the Discord community, who also this episode's guest director. If you too want to recommend a topic for a future episode, you can do so by joining the Discord community or you can support the podcast by buying it a coffee. The link to it is in the description. With all that done, thank you very much, everyone. Catch you next time. Bye. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job podcast, a Doc Network production. This episode was written, produced, and audio engineered by me, Russ Manuel, with additional research done by Laurie Favell. I'd really appreciate it, and it would help out the show if you took some time to share this with a friend, or leave a review on Spotify, or Google Podcasts, or iTunes, or anywhere that you listen to podcasts, as it really helps other people find the show. If you want to know more about today's episode, with photos, show notes, and transcripts, head to www.thedocnetwork.net and follow the show on IWODMJ on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't worry, there's a link in the show notes. If you want to follow me for history-related hijinks and other nerdery, you can follow me on practically everything at Doc Winters. 
Once again, thanks for listening and catch you next time. Bye.